it's just great to be able to have Bill Johnson here and to be able to learn from him and to grow in our walk and our leadership uh, because of his example. I also wanna recognize the Bethel students. Let's see where the Bethel students at. They're over there. Yeah, so. Um, but you know, one of the things that has really helped me, I'm an incurable question asker. And so I probably have worn Bill out every time he's around me. I'm like, I'm going to ask you this question. So I, I've got lots of questions, but you know, that's the way we learn is to ask questions. And I just thought to have Bill uh, here in the area and not give you the opportunity to really just ask questions and uh, to learn from somebody who's been a world leader in helping people um, not only respond to the presence of God, but grow deep in his presence and to experience a move of God. Uh, my big question when I first met Bill was, you know, there have been a lot of moves of God. And one of the unique things about Bethel is that you have sustained a move of God over decades. And um, it's, that's unique. And I think that has, so I said, I, I can't be you. And James River's not Bethel. And in God's purpose, he wants us to be us. But I want to learn what it is that you feel would help me and Debbie uh, be able to sustain a move of God. And what do you have to do? And so uh, that's where our discussion started on that day. And um, by the end of our discussion, Brandon was listening in the background. And when uh, Bill and Benny went to the hotel, Brandon uh, turned to me and he said, do you think any of the rest of us are Christians? And <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, um, Bill, it's just so good to have you. I want you to greet the people. But then I would like you to maybe answer that question, uh, you know, to start there, because I think that's something everybody really wants to know. And then we're gonna open it up for questions. You can ask your questions. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> glad, glad you came, glad you showed up. Um, you know, it's, it's uh, I, I experienced a, a wonderful move of God in 1987. And to be honest, it would come and go over the next several years. And I remembered praying a prayer in 1995. I said, God, if you'll touch me again, I'll never change the subject. And something happened in that season where I learned a concept that I didn't know before. Um, I, I always thought moves of God were entirely sovereign in the sense that God would choose when to show up and when not to. And then there was this concept in scripture that shouted to me, and that's that God lights the fire on the altar, but the priests keep it burning. So it means that God starts, but it's up to us to continue, to maintain. And simply put, a fire keeps burning as long as there's fuel. And we're the fuel. We're the, we're the living offering. And so it means we put ourselves in place of vulnerability, put ourselves in places of risk, uh, the willingness to obey no matter what it looks like. Those simple elements. You, you don't grade a move of God by how good the last meeting was. It's, it's much deeper and much more profound than that. And, you, you know, we have days where there, you know, things are just unbelievable in the sense of what has happened. And there are other times not so much. But you can't... <sighs> But moves of God get aborted. Aborted because we despise the day of small beginnings. And in uh, 1997, I went to uh, Argentina. I went with Randy Clark and I wanted to see, you know, we, we were experiencing this outpouring of the Spirit and I had heard about what was happening in Argentina and I wanted you know, they'd been going on for decades, and I wanted to see. So I, I went there to see, uh, to serve, to minister with Randy and all of that. But I, I, I wanted to see. So I, I went and I, I examined what was happening to compare. Not comparison in a sense of success or fail, 
but just to, to gauge out of a historic perspective. And, uh, and I came back with this realization. The revival in Argentina is a big, red, ripe apple. And what was happening in Redding was a small, tart, green little thing. But they were both 100% apple. If you don't honor what God has given you, you know, most of us pray, our prayers are for, if I can use a metaphor, we pray for oak trees. God gives us acorns. And if you don't steward what he gives you, you don't end up with what you asked for. And most of us can't handle oak trees. It's the journey with the acorn that develops the maturity to steward the, the oak tree. And that's really, that's the nature of the move of God, is that he, he puts us in a place so that we steward, so that we don't put our hands on the ark, so that we don't direct it according to what we think revival is supposed to look like. We're followers, we're not leaders. You know, two times it says of David, the Lord says, I took you from following the sheep to be shepherd over Israel. That you don't lead unless you know how to follow. And, uh, and for us, it's following the presence, so. Yeah. Wow, that's so good. So good. So David and Brendan are moving around with mics, and if you have a question, you're welcome to ask it. Um, while you're thinking of your questions, David, do you have a question? We've got some from yeah, the staff that some, they Some questions in. were pre-submitted because people were very excited about this. They couldn't wait to just raise their hand in the room. Um, a couple of questions. You mentioned yesterday in the message, you've mentioned in personal conversation, and then just, just now you mentioned steadying the ark. And, you know, obviously that's an Old Testament reference. What would you say for pastors, leaders who go, well, I don't want to, how do you see pastors inadvertently do that or consciously try to steady the ark in a way that disrupts what God would want to do in a space or in a move of, in a move that he's, he's carrying along? So that whole idea of steadying the ark. Revivals, uh, revivals typically do not end because of excess. Most every leader I know is concerned about excess. And to prevent excess, we exert control. You have to be willing to get it wrong in order to get it right. It's our fear of getting something wrong that actually puts us in a place to direct what God is about to do. The reason revivals off, almost always start with, for example, Asbury, led by students what's happening at the college. Why there? This isn't a, a criticism, this is a, an, an acknowledgement. Why there? Because they don't know what they're doing. Moves of God start with people who know what they don't know because then they're much more inclined to be dependent. And we have good intentions as leaders we want to make sure things get done decently and in, in order and all the above. But it just doesn't work. It's, moves of God are not squeaky clean. You know, it's, it's the scripture in Proverbs. Um, if there's no oxen, the manger is clean, but much increase comes by the strength of the ox. So what do you want? You want an ox with a mess or do you want a, a clean stall? Because church is one of those two things. It's either clean, no messes, or there's increase. Yeah. So, wow. Well, so if you will raise your hand yeah. around the room, Brandon and I will come to you, and we'll just take the questions in turn. Do you want to stand up? Okay. For, some, for seeing so many healings and having the faith for God to heal, how do you come to an understanding that God didn't heal someone? Yeah, big question. I don't know anyone that has that answer. <laughs> I'm, I'm here just to encourage you. <laughs> yeah, you know, I don't know. Um, I can find a few reasons in the Bible why people weren't healed. Um, for example, uh, the child that was brought to the disciples to be delivered, and they couldn't get him free. And then the father saw Jesus and brought his son to Jesus, and he set him free. If that were today, we would be the ones that tried to get him free and he didn't get free. 
And then we tend to create a theology around what didn't happen to explain why he wasn't free. Jesus came and brought deliverance to the child. I'm, I'm not going to give you an answer as much as I'm going to give you kind of a context for this journey that we're all in. And so Jesus brings deliverance, and the disciples take Jesus aside when they see that, and they, they ask why, why they couldn't get him free. Jesus says this kind only comes out with prayer and fasting. Most of us, from that story, come to the conclusion that prayer and fasting is the key. It's the secondary key. The first key is they took Jesus aside. If, if it doesn't happen like it says it's supposed to happen, find out why, because that's not normal. Instead of creating a theology around what doesn't happen, get along with God. Find out why. It's not a time for guilt and shame. Introspection won't fix anything. The answer's not here. The answer's there. And um, so what I have found is that more we do that, the less we have of those kinds of frustrations, if that makes sense. Why do people not get healed? I don't know, my wife died eight months ago today. My ability to live with mystery determines the level of revelation he can trust me with. And so my opportunities to experience something I can't explain. I won't create a theology around something Jesus didn't create a theology around. If he wanted us, if he wanted us to know how to live with unanswered prayers, he would have taught us but he didn't have any. So he didn't create a theology around that. It was always created around what he did. So that's how I've determined to live, and I don't have answers for that. I have my own sting. I have my own scars. And um, part of the privilege of walking with him is to walk with him in the midst of unanswered questions. What I won't do is I won't blame the person. I won't say you didn't have enough faith, that's why you're not healed. What I won't do is do guilt and shame. All of us can dig ourselves into a deep hole that's, you know, I can get in a hole that's so deep in 10 minutes that it takes me a week to crawl out, you know. <laughs> So I, I won't do that. So I don't have a good answer for you. I'm in the middle of those questions myself. But what I've determined to do, Jesus healed everyone who came to him and healed everyone the Father directed him to. He didn't heal everyone who was sick that was alive. We see the man at the gate that uh, was healed in Acts 3. But I'm still going to hold to his standard. And then uh, and just live with mystery and just try to improve my journey. I know this, the more people we pray for, the more people get healed. So, so, but yeah, it's a great question, and I, I wish I had an answer for that. It's part of my journey. That's really beautiful. Got a question here in the center. Hey, Bill, four years ago, I spent four hours praying in tongues. At the end of that time, the Spirit said, you can ask me what you will. This time I had the presence of mind to say, well, what should I ask? And immediately the scripture came to mind, ask of me and I will give you the nations as an inheritance. My wife and I were beginning a new work as dorm parents to 24 boys from China at a Christian school. So yesterday you were teaching about Saul and Saul was out looking for the donkeys. And then when he came to the prophet, he asked him, where are my donkeys? He didn't have the presence of mind to ask him, what's the word of God? So, Bill, what question should I be asking you? <laughs> that's, 
That's a question I've never had before. That's, uh, that's you, you win, yeah. Oh, probably what my favorite animal to hunt is or something like that, you know. That's, that's probably down my, <laughs> down my lane, you know. Oh, goodness, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, you know, the supreme value for me um, is the greatest gift that we have is the presence of God. And so learning to recognize him is huge. Um, uh, Israel, uh, the church today for probably centuries, we gather together every week and we gather around a sermon. Uh, but Israel camped around the presence. And I think that what the Lord's going to do in the coming years is going to teach us how to camp around the presence again. Let the sermon be an expression of that, but not be the focal point. And... Uh, so I think learning to recognize him is everything. Yeah. yeah. That's good. Okay. Let's see. We got a question over here. My question is, how do you invite the presence of the Lord in your just normal day-to-day -day activities? I discover him mostly uh, th through my affection. Um, if I can express affection for him, uh, he, this will sound um, maybe a little abstract, but let me see if I can make, uh, have this make sense. We try to exercise faith for miracles, which is appropriate. How about we exercise faith to discover him? Yeah. How about we exercise faith to actually to, to realize him? And so for me, my awareness of his presence dramatically increases the more I turn my heart towards him. It sounds backwards, but when I turn my heart towards him, he begins to manifest. It's not just he manifests and then I turn my heart towards him, if that makes sense. And so learning to live with a heart of affection continuously, I've never succeeded 24 seven, but the more I become aware of my need of him, I, I, instead, of, instead of asking him to come, I turn my heart toward the ones who's here. He said he'd never leave me or forsake me. And so I turn my affection towards him. And for me, my heart of affection, you know what it is to look at a, a baby child and just have such affection for a loved one. Um, turning your heart of affection towards him, he just draws near. He's such a lover that he manifests himself on the affections of his people. And so that's the strongest point for me. There may be dozens of ways that people in this room do that, but for me, that's, that's really my anchor. Uh, it's my heart of affection, just the awe that I have for him. It's not filled with words. It's not filled with a lot of actions. It's just a burning heart for him that I just turn towards him. And whenever I do that, he just begins to manifest. I don't want to say he wasn't there before, but I become aware of the one who is there. And, uh, and that's, that's what happens for me, yeah. And I learned the heart of affection in worship. It actually started, you know, 50 years ago, to be honest, when my dad began to teach us about ministering to the Lord, uh, priests of the Lord that ministered to him. And I, I would recognize that he would, that the atmosphere would change during worship. And, and in the presence, he actually taught me how to burn for him. And the way it works out is that, is that he burns for me, and that ignited me to burn for him. And so that's really the discovery. And it's a still an ongoing journey, but that's, that's what works for me. Yeah. Um, let me mention this and, and just ask this question because it really helped me. So as a leader, one of the things that at times can be uh, a challenge is to be able to understand what God is doing. You know, when, his, when the Lord comes down into a place, um, there's, you know, that how do I know what to do and how do I know what he's doing? And, and um, so I would asked you that question several months ago and you gave me an answer that I have thought on that has helped me so much and it's out of Mark 8. So it's the passage you talked about yesterday and how in those moments when the presence of God is so real, uh, how that passage applies and the questions you ask yourself in his presence. Can you talk a little bit about that? Are you you're referring to, can you see, yeah. can you, yeah. In Mark 8, Jesus is taking uh, his guys through this series of lessons because they, they, 
They missed it again. And so he, he asked them, can you see? And there's no answer. Can you hear? There's no answer. Can you remember? And what happens for me is there are times, often, I can't see. In other words, I, I have no perception of what he's doing. And so he's asking the question, can you see? And my answer is, no, I, I, I'm not seeing anything. I don't mean seeing angels fly across the room. It's just you have this internal capacity to perceive what God is doing. And there are times I have to answer, no, I don't see it all. So he asked the second question, can you hear? My hearing is better than my seeing, but there are times where I'm not hearing either. And then he asked the third question, can you remember? What's interesting is seeing and hearing we would consider to be spiritual gifts or graces, abilities. Remembering is willful. I, will always, I always am capable of remembering what I value most. And so just being able to recall to mind what I've seen God do. For example, let's say we're having a healing time right now and I'm trying to discern what God's doing and, I, and I'm not getting anything. I can't see, I can't hear. What I will do consciously that I'll never tell you about is I'll, rem I'll try to remember what's the last thing I saw him do. And let's just say it was opening deaf ears, that that's the last thing. So all I've done is I've remembered. Well, then we'll start pursuing that. I'll not pretend it's a word of knowledge. I'll just say we frequently see deaf ears open. So I'd have people with deaf ears, uh, loss of hearing, raise their hands. We would pray. And what happens is once I start remembering, my hearing improves. And then I start hearing words of knowledge. Oh, God is healing this right now. God is uh, doing this in a, in a household, a business. He's doing this. And as soon as I start hearing better, my, my seeing pr improves. And so there's, there's a sequence. If you want to know, if you want to see what he's doing, start remembering. You can actually activate your own capacity for hearing and seeing by choosing to remember what God has done. And one of the words for testimony in the Old Testament is a very interesting word. It actually comes from the word that means to do again. Think about it. A testimony comes from a word that means to do again. Spurgeon captured this, Charles Spurgeon. He said, when we look at things that God has done in the past, we're not just looking at historical events. We're looking at something that God wants to do again. The very fact that he did it once is a legal precedent for what he wants to do again. That theme is carried on in the New Testament, that the testimony of Jesus, the, the written or spoken record of anything God has done, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. He's declaring into the present what he's wanting to do now. And so anyway, just by learning, learning to cultivate a spiritual discipline of recalling to mind what he's done actually improves our hearing and our seeing. So fantastic. Yeah, that's so Pastor good. Bill, back here in the back. Oh, sorry, Colin. Here you yes, go. Lord. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> there you yeah. Go. Uh, in the context of healing and when people say receive it or reach out, how does one receive healing, specifically a healing you've been praying a long time for? Um, usually by getting out of anxiety. Uh, what happens is we have, we often uh, uh, create so much pressure for ourselves to try to obtain something from the Lord. And to be frank, most of my striving is flesh. It, it has nothing to do with the spiritual exercise. And if I can get out of anxiety and get into a place, anxiety, um, Anxiety is oftentimes soulish effort towards faith. Oh, wow. That's it's a striving to believe, not realizing that the nature of faith actually comes out of rest. Comes out of rest of who he is, comes out of rest for what he has said. And so just dealing with anxiety will help a lot. You know, just, just, to, just to realize Jesus has actually already accomplished what I'm asking for. You know, he's, he's already done the work. He doesn't need to do a work. Uh, the Apostle Paul said in Ephesians, he says, God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Every spiritual blessing. How many of you think revelation is a spiritual blessing? 
I remember you think wisdom is a spiritual blessing. So he says in verse three, he's already blessed us with every spiritual blessing, but in verse 17, he prays for the spirit of wisdom and revelation to come. Is that a contradiction? No, because it's all in your account, but it's not all in your possession. You can have a million dollars in the bank and starve to death if you don't make withdrawals. And so we have things that are in our account. Healing is one of them. And in this whole Christian life is learning to make withdrawals. It's really, it's learning to pull out of what Christ has already done for us. So does that make any sense? The, the, the thing that we, that we need to fight for is we need to fight to rest. We need to fight to protect the heart of rest because the heart of rest is the birthplace of real faith. That's fantastic. Okay, David. Yeah, so you've talked before in messages about the baptism of fire and there being an infilling of the Holy Spirit that overflows. I think you wrote about it in your book. Dr. Randy Clark talked about it, Smith Wigglesworth. You see it in a lot of generals of the faith's life. And so from that point, there's a supernatural boldness to not be afraid to share the gospel anywhere you go with whoever you meet. There's a power to command and decree the authority of Christ to see an unusual success in praying for healing. So how do we as believers practically pursue that and receive that infilling of the Holy Spirit that results in overflow? I don't know any other way to do it than to cry out. You know, it's, it's what you do in private. It's what, it's what wakes you up in the night. I had a, a, a period of time... Um, where I had seen what God was doing in the earth and I was so hungry for it that I would pray literally day and night. I, I actually would wake myself up praying. I didn't wake up to pray. I was crying out to God in my sleep so much that it would wake me up and I would get up to pray. I, I don't know any other way to do it than, than to do that. I mean, there's obviously the study of scripture. We want the scriptures to fuel our heart with promise with a prophetic sense of what God intends to do. We have the beautiful privilege of joining with other people that have, had, that have levels of breakthrough that we don't have. There's something about associating with people. I, I, uh, in 1987, uh, some of our, our, our team uh, at the church, we went down to Anaheim to join, uh, to attend a John Wimber conference. And... Um, I had taught basically everything that I heard at that conference that they were teaching, I had already taught. But it's frustrating for me because they had fruit for what they believed and I just had good theology. And in that event, I realized I needed to put a greater demand on what I believed and I needed to take greater risk. I, I couldn't just teach it and expecting it to happen. God was looking for someone to partner with and he partners with people who live with risk. And so sometimes you associate, when we came home from that, I had prayed for people for years, never saw anybody healed. When we came home from that event, nobody laid hands on me, nobody prophesied, nobody prayed. Nobody, I didn't read their books, I didn't do anything. I just came home and prayed and people got healed. Something was in the room that got on me. You know, it was, I, I caught a virus. <laughs> And, uh, and it, it affected me. So sometimes associating with, with people that have levels of break that you don't have, that helps. So those are the three things that I encourage people to do. Is you cry out to God privately, that's the main thing. But then look for people that carry what you're hungry for. And sometimes they'll pray for you and it changes everything. Sometimes just literally being in the room with them. It, it, uh, you access what God has graced them with. And uh, it's, it changes everything. You know. Pastor Bill, over here to your left. Hi. Um, how do you deal with rumors and criticism when people take your sermons out of context? I don't know. I've never had that happen. I, uh, I've, I've heard about people that have that experience. But, uh, <laughs> um, for the most part, I ignore it, to be honest with you. I, I don't. I don't pay much attention. Sometimes I have to pay attention. And so what I do is I, I like to take communion. Uh, 
I don't get it every day. I forgot to bring my stuff with me this time. But uh, I, I typically uh, take communion day after day. And I have a list of, of five uh, uh, people, three of which are internationally known, that uh, target me in their uh, messages and their books and stuff. And uh, so when I take communion, I pray that God will uh, prosper them inside and out, prosperity of soul, that they will have a rich legacy, that their children and grandchildren will serve Jesus. And um, that's what I do. I just, I, I just try to bless, bless the folks, yeah. yeah. That's great. Okay. Okay, so I think, I can't remember if it was Father of Lights or one of your messages, but when your birthday comes around, I believe you mentioned you buy presents for other people on your birthday. I was curious what prompted that and why. Um, I buy it for my, uh, my children and my grandchildren. I overheard a couple of my grandkids talking one time. They were, they were talking together. They didn't know I was listening. One of them asked the other one, what are you going to ask Papa for his birthday? <laughs> and I thought, man, I'm there right under Christmas. This is awesome. <laughs> um, I don't know. I just I thought it was a good idea. Uh, years ago, I just started buying gifts for my kids and grandkids, and we have a big party at the house. And and um, because of the way the father is, um, I I only get one chance to demonstrate that. And uh, That's so, cool. so I thought it'd be a fun way for me to do it, to to illustrate what uh, what our father is like. And uh, so th that's that's the fun for me. Yeah. Right over here. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, thank you, guys. I'm just such uh, so humbled by uh, being here. My wife and I are from Nicaragua. We, we uh, started a church in Nicaragua four years ago. Just a small, humble thing. We're like 50 families. And so maybe this question is for both of you, but we're, uh, um, you know, just reading what you said about anxiety is a soulish uh, effort towards faith. Sometimes you're like, really anxious seeing how big the vision is that God's placed before you and realizing you have, it's just us and the five-hold five hold ministry. You're looking, should we raise this up from inside or is this something we pull from outside? Um, and sometimes coming against all those problems and issues, you feel like, where is the uh, equipping? You say you equip those who, who you send. So how do you deal with that and uh, like have the patience that it takes to... Uh, like wait for the, all of those pieces to come together in the process. Do you want to try to answer that? <laughs> <laughs> um, I believe strongly in the fivefold ministry, and I, it's, it's worth praying into that God would provide each. But I, I don't ever want to try to force it or try to try to make sure that we have all five. I, if we only have one, that's fine with me. If it's really powerful. Um, so I don't feel any pressure to make sure we have all five, personally. I want to recognize what we do have that's authentic, that's proven, that's tested. It's easier to lay hands on someone than to take them off. It's easier to ordain someone than it is to remove the ordination from them when they don't prove to be faithful. So I would, rather, I would rather give them opportunity to serve and to display their heart of loyalty and responsibility and then later give them the level of authority that, that they deserve to walk in that. That's my, that's my approach. I, uh, we now, you know, we have a, a, a large uh, staff and everything and we have all five honestly functioning well in our staff, but it wasn't always that way. And that was okay. We, God still showed up. Um, uh, when you have uh, all five functioning well, then the people of God become more fully equipped for the work of service. But, um, but I, I don't feel any pressure to make sure that we have all five, if that makes sense. I, 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 I don't like that pressure because then I'll, I'll look at somebody who prophesies and assume that they're a prophet, and I don't want to do that. I'll look at someone who good, is good at witnessing on the streets and call them an evangelist. I don't want to do that. I want to make sure that I hear from the Lord about their governmental role. Everyone gets to do the stuff, 
but not everyone carries the governmental role. I want to make sure that I recognize that before I, before I, I set them in place. So, so and, and to do that well, I actually have to live with no anxiety to have to have all those positions filled. And I can live for years without it being filled. As long as the pastor who's the pastor is really a pastor and the teacher who's the teacher is really a teacher, I'm good with that. So that's how, that's how we function. So I don't know if that helps, but yeah. And I would just say this as well. Don't forsake the day of small beginnings. Everything at James River started little. And sometimes we can, what, what creates insecurity over the size of what's happened is when we compare what's happening to somebody else or to our own expectations that um, it hasn't happened as quickly as we would like. And so um, you have to do what you can do and rest in that. I, I would just tell this story when we were first moved here and um, I was driving, I had a 1975 truck it was 375 miles or 375,000 miles on it, just rusted out. I was driving down the highway and I was listening to the radio and it was advertising some big Christmas extravaganza. And we'd moved here in October. And so in November, they're advertising this. And I remember, I can remember where I was on James River Expressway and I can remember listening to it and I can remember saying this, we could never do anything like that. Instantly, the Lord spoke to me and said, that's right, but you can do what you can do. And I mean, it was very convicting, but I was like, you know, you can do what you can do. And instantly I began to think, well, what could we do? And so out of that, we started doing something and our first Christmas was me dressed up in a costume. And so, um, you know, and we did it and, uh, uh, you know, Sometimes we, over, we underestimate just the power of being faithful to the opportunity and the seeds that are being planted. But everything at James River has started small. Everything has. Don't, don't despise the day of small beginnings. Every prayer you're praying, every act of faithfulness is sowing seed that God is going to water and is going to bring a harvest greater than you can imagine. Always. That's the way the kingdom works. So be encouraged. Over here. Hi, my name is Stone Moss. My wife and I planted a church here in Springfield about six months ago. And I just wanted you to give me some insight, maybe some advice on how when you're starting something from the beginning and you want to create this, you know, curate this culture that honors God and as a spirit-led church and even from its beginning and its, and its young, um, you know, at its start, how do we make sure that everything we're doing, and it can get to where it's almost system-driven and we're creating a, you know, something from the ground up. So how do we make sure that we're also pursuing this, what we experienced here at James River last night? How, are we, how do we make sure that we curate a culture of that from the ground up? A culture is what sustains a move. It's not hard to have breakthrough moments, but what, what makes it possible for that to continue is that you actually develop a culture that anticipates the newness of God, that values any time he shows up, whether he does something extremely significant, many people are saved, wheelchairs are empty, or what appears to be insignificant, people came and found peace and are just encouraged. A culture that values his presence, a culture that values people. Uh, the Lord spoke to me one day after a very disappointing meeting out of the Gospel of Matthew. He said, go learn what this means. I desire compassion above sacrifice. We had just given a great sacrifice of praise, but it was a dead meeting. We had given the offering, but it was outside of the context of love and affection for people around us. So after that day, I targeted creating a context for the sacrifice. And the context was the value that we had for each other. If you make what he prioritizes, he said, if you come to offer a gift and you remember your brother has all against you, he prioritizes 
healthy connection. So if we, if we value what he values, then we've actually, we actually have created the context for him to show up. He's the diamond. The setting is what you have on your ring. The relationships with people is the setting. It invites the diamond to come, if that, if that, makes, that analogy makes sense. So you just value what he values. And uh, don't, uh, don't evaluate yourself often. Um, introspection, self-criticism, self-doubt kills more moves of God maybe than anything. Because people will look at something so simple and they'll say, well, this isn't a move of God. And they just aborted something that God actually ignited. The seed of a revival was in that touch. And uh, so value the small things, celebrate them. Uh, for us, you know, we had a miracle, and we, we would just talk about that one miracle over and over again for a long time, because the only one we had, you know. Uh, but if you don't value what he values, then you can't be entrusted with what he wants to do. So it's just adjusting your talk, uh, your expectations. Simplify, simplify, simplify. Um, stay away from hype. Make sure that it's authentic. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Right here in the center. Well, this this has been so rich, so good. Um, my question for you would be on pastoring, and I understand you guys have done it for a bit. Um, if you were to talk to like a twenty-year-old self, what would you put your time to, your attention, and uh, yeah, just to young pastoring in your twenties? Yeah. If I could talk with my 20-year-old self, I have something to say. <laughs> you know, for me, uh, my weak point for so many years was self-criticism and self-doubt. Uh, I would analyze myself all the time and always fall short. You know, how many of you have gone deep introspection before? Anybody ever done that? How many of you came out encouraged? <laughs> it, it just doesn't happen you know it just doesn't, you, you don't get it there you know and uh, and I learned after a while that that my self-analysis was really creating problems for me and uh, and I had to repent because uh, when you feel bad you can be deceived into thinking it's humility if you feel bad enough then you don't think highly of yourself and that's translated as humility. It's still pride because it's self-focused. And so I had to repent my way out of that one. And uh, the, the, way, the, the way it worked out for me is I said, Lord, I'm in your word every day. I don't miss it. And it's, it's a sword. So I invite you, please cut me. Expose in me what needs to change. I'm with your people all the time. Give me the slap of a friend. I'm in the fire of your presence. So burn out of me the impurities. But I'm not going to look for problems in me anymore. I'll trust you to identify them through the tools that you use to shape us. And that change made a huge difference in me. And so that's what I would tell my, honestly, my 20 year old self. I say, listen, you don't have to wait 20 years to get this one. <laughs> you, can, you can get it now. Uh, just stop the introspection, stop the self-analysis, the evaluating, comparing yourself. Just stop it because it's, uh, it, it cripples you. So, yeah. That's so good. We have a question over here. My name is Charles. I'm from Rwanda. I'm going to seminar here in Springfield. And I was in a training this week that um, said 70 to 80 percent of churches in America are in decline. Now, I came here to James River yesterday. We got here around five. Uh, people were here, halfway full. Um, the center was halfway full. I'm confused. Because, I mean, I've seen miracles in Rwanda, in, in Africa, miracles pop up like popcorn. I've seen that. that. That did not move me. But I was moved to see people come to church three uh, hours before the beginning of the service and just be there. This is in America where people are in a hurry all the time. What is happening? Why is it happening here that other churches are not doing it? What, what's, what's the problem? Um, I don't know if it's you or Pastor uh, John, whoever, any of you can ask this question. I'm okay with that, but I'm just confused. I, I don't understand this. Go for it. <laughs> um, 
You know, uh, I really, and I'm not trying to, I'll say if there's anything I have to add to it, but one of the things that I've been interested in is Bill's understanding of what God is doing here. Um, we're in a unique season. Uh, we're in a season where God is moving uh, and has been for a couple of years. And so because of that, um, people want to be in his presence. They can sense his presence. But uh, Bill, how, how would you, um, I mean, you see it. You're in a lot of places, so it's not unique to James River. But you would say um, from the places you see where people are engaged in the way he, he is expressing, what do you see in all of those places that you would call the common denominators? Because I guess, you know, Bethel's Bethel, James River's James River, but in the places where you've been and you have much more breadth of experience and observation from that, what are some of the common denominators that you see in those places that are bringing about an engagement of people and a hunger of people? There's a lot of places, a lot of people have hunger for God to do something significant, extraordinary. But oftentimes, even in great moves of God, there's a high percentage of people that enjoy it, but they remain spectators. And what's happened here that you've helped to cultivate is opportunity for people to, to get involved and to be a part of it themselves. Because once you taste it, you, you, you never get... Let me, let me give an illustration. You see that sign above the door over there? It's an exit sign. None of us, when we leave today, will crawl out of that sign. Because the sign points to something greater than itself. And all signs point to something greater than itself. All miracles point to a person. And when you follow the sign and discover the person, it never gets old. But when you stay with the sign, it gets old. It doesn't matter what the miracle is. Man on the ground, eventually they complained. It was a sign. So anytime we have signs, that's the beginning of something powerful, possibly. But it can also be the very point we become hard and resistant because we become accustomed to what God is doing. And it has happened historically with miracles. So signs, the way, the way you keep fresh is that you follow the sign to the person because he never gets old. He never, ever, ever gets old. And what you've done is you've, you've brought people in to be involved with a person, not just a manifestation, not just the miracles. I love the miracles, and I'll, I'll never apologize for in, delighting in the miracles, but the miracles always reveal the nature of a person. And if you follow the sign to the person, the signs don't diminish, they increase, but you can be trusted with them because it's about him. It's not about us. It's not about miracles even. It's about him being who he is, displaying his nature among his people. And, uh, and that really is, is the sustainable factor. And that's what you've done. You know, you've got, you've got people that are fully engaged, not because they want to be entertained by miracles, but because they want to be used by God to see something significant happen. And, and that makes all the difference in the world. Right here in the center. Hi, my name is Billy Cockrum. I pastor a small church in Northwest Springfield. And, um, you know, we've been seeing all kinds of things that God's been doing, miracles of all kinds. But I find myself trying to just praying for God's discernment. Um, we know that sometimes people have legitimate uh, physical problems. Sometimes it could be some kind of demonic thing, um, some kind of generational kind of oppression. Um, how do you know the difference and how do you address those things in a way that is honoring to God and helps them to be delivered or to be healed? Um, like I said, we've been seeing them healed, um, but sometimes I wrestle with 
what is really going on here. Are you asking about one-on-one -on -one ministry or corporate? So, you know, at the end of our services, people come forward and I ask them, okay. what do you need prayer for? Okay, all right. If it's corporate, I deal with it through teaching. If it's individual, then you try to have to discern uh, what you're in in a moment. And, and I don't, uh, I rarely know what's going on, to be really frank. <laughs> they, they tell me I have this problem. I assume, always, my assumption is God wants them to be healed and he wants to heal them right now. Generally, what I do is I begin to pray. And if I have certain things that come up in my heart, I, I'm not on a witch hunt. I, I don't. Is, as weird as it sounds, I don't even need them to repent for them to get healed. Because sometimes I, I had a situation, um, I was pr praying for this gal and, and, and I just sensed unforgiveness on her. And, and I, don't, I don't do this typically, but I stopped and I said, do you need to forgive anyone? And she says, you don't realize what they did to me. So, oh, I touched a nerve here. <laughs> And typically, I won't pray for someone who refuses to repent. They're bitter and they won't repent. I just, I won't pray for them because I don't want to, I just don't want to. And uh, you, you cast it out, it comes back seven times worse. I'm, I'm going to have mercy on them and leave them where they are. But in this particular case, uh, I had several points that she just objected to. She, she was resistant all the way through and I thought, lady, I, I just want to pray for you and go and have lunch, you know. And, uh, but she resisted at every point and I was going to stop and leave and I had this compassion thing rise up in me and I just ignored all of her objections, her unbelief and her resentment. And I just laid hands on her, she was instantly healed. And what happened is she dropped her knees and she said, I didn't deserve it. And in that moment, I saw something that I had not seen before in this level, the kindness of God led her to repentance. It was her being healed when she didn't deserve it. So I just try to pay attention. I, I try to make sure I have no personal agenda. I'm not judging outward appearance because you can miss that completely. Um, either, either way. So I have a clean slate. And when I start praying, I pay attention to impressions. And I don't accuse them. I don't say you're filled with resentment. I say, hey, is there anyone you need to forgive? Just, I'm just asking a question. It's not an accusation. And I just try to walk them through. Uh, when I need to. Uh, I would rather just pray and see them get healed, but sometimes I have to walk them through stuff. But just pay attention, have no agenda, have a clean slate, and then pay attention to impressions. And generally, he'll lead you through. And then if I'm not getting any breakthrough, I have Michael pray for him. So. <laughs> <laughs> Avery, did you have a question? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, come on up here, and I'm going to let you just... <laughs> So I've been inspired for many years by Bethel worship and their ability to just flow with the spirit, but also in their songwriting culture. And I believe that's something the Lord wants to do in this church. And we want to learn how to ignite that here and how to steward that here. So I would love to hear from your perspective, what did it take for you? And what, was, what should we be asking God for? And what practical system should we be putting in place to steward whatever he has to give us? Yeah, you guys, you guys have that happening here. It's, it's wonderful to see. Um, I met with our worship uh, teams. Uh, I meet with them periodically, and I met with our writers. And I, I asked them a question. I said, what do, you, what do you want the church to look like in 10 years? Write about it now, because we'll sing our way into it. <laughs> so Get a prophetic sense of where we're headed. Because people, people will actually embrace truth in a song that they would reject in a teaching. And so tap, tap in prophetically. Um, don't write songs just because it's a good theme. Write out of your experience. If, and as much as you can, write out of your own relationship. And it would be better to have a simple song that was authentic than a profound song that didn't have its roots in our own experience. And uh, so those are the kinds of things we, we urge our teams to do. And the result is, is they're, they're writing more theologically profound songs all the time. And part of that is it's the reason. It's, it's, it's becoming more and more authentic. Their experiences are much more profound and deep. And, uh, and so they're able to draw from those those things, yeah. Uh, John and Charles Wesley 
Charles would write the, the theology of John Wesley in song. And it was the way they learned theology was in music. And uh, so, you know, take that as a tool. Uh, not every song has to be a big song. Some songs are meant to be building block songs. They, they're important in that they introduce an idea, but you don't have to spend 20 minutes singing it. You know, spend three minutes singing it, then move on to the big song. But it's a, it's, it sets the stage emotionally and mentally for what God is saying. So just l learn the place of each song, yeah. So good. We have one yes. question over here. Hi, my name is Emma Turner. Emma Turner. I'm a James River College student. My question is: Is how do you do? How do you minister to someone who has who has a doubt and limitation on God and His healings? Limitation, uh, doubt, and limitations on God for what? For healing? Could yeah, for say? healings. Well, it, you know, it depends. Um, I shared a story a minute ago about a gal who was filled with resentment. She was extremely resistant to what God was doing. And I've seen God bypass people's objections. Um, one, of our, one of our key guys did, was planning, he, he had been on the church board for, around the church for 25 years, and he did not like what was happening. He was planning his exodus uh, and leaving the church forever, going to another church. And I called a meeting of our leaders, and the Spirit of God sovereignly fell upon him and chose him. He had no option. He literally had no option. And he was turned into another man in a 45 minute encounter. He, from one who was resistant and wanted to leave to the most on fire person in our world. Literally in a 45 minute encounter. And so sometimes God just sovereignly does that. Other times he lets people walk through their mess. And uh, I just try to make sure I, I, I don't try to force what I think and feel upon them. What I do try to do is make sure that they know I love and care for them. I don't feel the need to convince anybody. I, I don't need them to agree with my theology for me to love them. And so I, honestly, that's how simple I keep it. If they ask honest questions, I'll serve them with answers. If they ask uh, interrogating questions, I may or may not answer. Uh, it, it just depends. But the big thing is that you pray for them and you love them. And if you feel a burden to pray, let's say they have a, an injury and you want to pray for them and say, well, I don't think it'll work. If you still have that faith for it, go for it anyway because the Lord can, can retrain them on how he moves by going past. You know, he moves beyond our faith all the time. So he's, he's certainly not limited by what I believe. Um, and so I, I like to give him opportunity to do that if that makes sense. So you just, you just kind of pay attention to the heart of the Lord in your heart as you go through that journey. Two more questions. All right, we got one right here. Hey, Pastor Bill, I'm a student of revival. I got saved at Brownsville, where it was Steve Hill for a number of years. And in studying revival, one thing that is a common denominator is the individuals that God used, the intensification of their prayer life over years and decades. In, in studying Steve, uh, when he first got saved, he prayed a couple hours a day. When Brownsville broke, he's praying seven hours a day, uh, continual fasting. You look at the life of William Seymour from his inception to the day of Azusa, and I know it's not a number of hours or a specific rhythm, but would you talk to us a little bit about your prayer life? And I would just make an assumption that it probably intensified from your burden, your hunger for revival, your desire for awakening, and then as you began to see the fruit and breakthrough, and just as a minister, um, I'm trying to always discern how I need to intensify my devotion and prayer before the Lord. Um. Strangely, my prayer life got more simple. It, it didn't intensify in the sense of, um, of, of my own intensity, my own uh, you know, aggressiveness in the presence. Um, I, I became more simple. And um, according to scripture, our day begins at night. 
In Genesis 1, it says, there was night and there was day, which made the first day. So it actually begins at night. So for me, my day begins when I get into bed. And in bed, I turn my affection towards the Lord, and that sets the, that sets the pace or the standard for the rest of the next 24 hours. And in the night, if I wake up in the night to use the restroom or there's a noise or whatever, I just wake up, I try to re-engage with the presence of the Lord. And the thing that has changed the most in my own personal prayer life, first of all, if I have an hour to pray, generally I'm going to worship for 35, 40 minutes. The rest of it, I'll pray for things. If I have 10 minutes to pray, usually six or seven minutes will be worship. And, and it's a lot, you can pray for a lot of stuff in three minutes. And so that's been my approach. Um, but perhaps the most unique part of my prayer life that has changed is that I used to think the hour, the two hours, or the 30 minutes, or whatever it is that, you have, that you're going to pray, I used to think that was, you know the, the metaphor uh, icing on the cake? The cake is the substance, the icing is the bonus. I used to approach that my hour with God, let's just take an hour, my hour with God is, uh, is the cake and the fellowship with him throughout the day is the bonus, it's the icing. But it's turned for me. Now it's my ongoing fellowship with him throughout the day is the substance and the bonus is the hour or the 10 minutes or the two hours, whatever it might be. And uh, I'm, I'm trying to learn how to have that continuous place of fellowship and adoration with him. Sometimes it's very intense. There's prayer, there's fasting, there's all of that where there's very focused and intense times of prayer. But most of my prayer life is very, very simple, uh, just delight in a perfect father. Uh, there's, uh, it probably disappoints you, but there's, there's not a lot of intensity in it. It's, uh, it's literally just the, just the delight in who he is. I have found that if I can anchor my soul in the goodness of God, I'm different in how I serve people. I'm, I'm different in the way I approach the problems of my life or my day or the challenges that we have at church, as a church or whatever. My approach is different. If, when I live continuously intense, I'm not as nice a person. And that's just for me. I just noticed through the years, I, I, uh, I'm harder on people. I'm harder on myself. There's something that happens in me that's, that's not that good. And I've, I've learned in my own prayer time that if I live with that kind of intensity, not that it doesn't work for you, but for me, it, te it tends to get translated into a harshness that uh, I become much more like an Old Testament prophet than uh, than a New Testament grace giver. And I, I just, I found that it wasn't healthy for me. It wasn't good, I was much more self-critical. And, uh, and I found that if I can anchor in the goodness of God and come alive in my delight in him, come alive in my affection for him, everything about my life improves, including the manifestations of miracles and breakthroughs and, and the amount of people whose lives are changed. I found one of the most important things, this isn't the question I, I realized, but let me throw it out. One of the most important things I, I learned early on is that if I ministered to the people of God as though I believed they were actually born again, it changed how I, how I ministered to them. Because if I believe they were born again, then I have to believe that in their heart of hearts they want to do whatever God says. And if I begin in my ministry to them with that assumption, I approach them as a loving father, not as a prophet who's trying to goad them and, and you know, motivate them to, do, to obey God because I know they really want to disobey God. And, uh, and that shift is a part of that prayer process for me. So anchoring in the goodness of God and making that my chief delight, knowing that there are times of intensity, but there are times of great rejoicing. If I take that approach, I do better. And for my own sanity, that's, that's my approach. <laughs> so weird, weird answer, I know. Last that's question. That's the best I can do. So we have one last question over here, and I'm going to ask you to stand. And as she stands up, I would just say to you, everybody in this room, I know many of you are registered for tomorrow, but Pastor Bill has graciously agreed to do one more leadership session tomorrow, Tuesday at 10 a.m. So if you're not registered for it, you should get registered for it. So final question. 
Hi. Um, last night you prophesied over this region that this would, we would host the glory of the Lord. And I just wanted, I had this memory of about 10 years ago when the glory cloud came to Bethel. And I wanted to hear a firsthand first witness testimony of the glory cloud, what that looked like, what that experience was like. And then if you have any advice for us on how we welcome that, how we prepare our hearts for it, and how we host the presence of the Lord like that um, without turning it into idolatry, but really pursuing his heart and his presence and being a good witness for him. Yeah, it's a great question. It's interesting because we were just talking about the glory cloud before we, we came over to this, uh, we were over pastor's office earlier. And uh, we actually had this uh, glory cloud show up 26 times over a period of uh, a year, maybe a year and a half, somewhere in there. And it was just, it's just an unusual thing. It's something you can't explain. It's not something we asked for and it's not something we chased away <laughs> that I know of. Um, but uh, it's, it's, it's the illustration that I gave about the exit sign. If, if, you make, if you make that the object of your, of your affection, it's not that you'll fall, it's just that you can't be trusted with much more. You, you've got to follow his signs to what it's pointing to, the glorious one. And I don't think it's, I don't think it's a bad thing to be enamored with a sign. I mean, I, I think... I think I'm kind of dumb if I don't. If I if I see God do some extraordinary thing, um, I I should be captivated by it. But at the end of the day, it's to deepen my affection for Him, not my need. I don't need it. I don't need to have an addiction to signs to make me feel good about myself or feel good about the church. Um, the glory of the Lord is the manifest presence of Jesus. Sometimes it's visible. Sometimes it's just an overwhelming realization. And uh, I don't need a visible sign. I just want to make sure he's here. And how do I know? First of all, he said so in his word. But secondly, when he begins to manifest in his glory, there are certain effects on the people of God that are, that are just, uh, they're undeniable. Undeniable. You suddenly have a person who had no interest in God as I mentioned earlier, this friend of mine, no interest in following what God was doing in revival, becomes the leader in 45 minutes. When the glory shows up, that's what happens. You, you have these individuals that are not known for any gifting whatsoever, and so all of a sudden, everybody they pray for gets healed. Or they have this boldness to stand and to preach the gospel in a context that you've never seen before. And that's not their personality. It's when that glory comes. He, what I think is we were born for the glory. It says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So it means the original target for every one of us was to live in the manifest presence of Jesus. That was, we were designed for it. There's a seamless connection between the sold out believer and the glory. And it's designed that way. And when we rediscover the glory like that, um, it changes how we think, it changes what we value, what's important to us. Suddenly, all the things that used to be important to make a good meeting, now I don't care. I mean, it's, it's good that these things happen, but you know, when the glory cloud would come, who, who wants to stand up and try to teach? <laughs> when you've got this cloud, it's like, I, I don't have anything worth saying. Uh, apparently God is talking right now and uh, I'm, I'm not in competition, you know, and, and that's really what happens is, is you just have this overwhelming sense of presence. I mean, our folks would be sitting in the room, they'd call their family members at home, they'd be in their pajamas ready to go to bed and they would get dressed and run on down just to see, you know, the children would run into the middle of this cloud with their mouths open, their eyes open, their arms open, they'd run right into this presence. You know, I always thought if God showed up in that way that it would be fearful, and he certainly can come in a terrifying way. Um, but in that particular season, it wasn't. It was inviting. And it's criticized because by many because it, it, there, was, there, was no, uh, there was no terror in the experience. There was only delight. But, you know, we respond to him, how he shows up. He, he shows up to invite and that's the way he did for us. So what, what I say for you guys 
is be hungry, but don't think you know how he's going to do it. Yeah, don't, don't, don't try to get it figured out because he loves to surprise us. You know, every miracle in the Bible that's listed, every miracle in the New Testament that Jesus did, he did differently. He, he, didn't, he didn't duplicate anything. Um, he mud in one person, you know, one person's eye to another. He says, go wash in the pool of Siloam to another. You know, I mean, it's just everything was, was unique. And what he's going to do at James River will be the same glory, the same kingdom, but it'll be a unique expression. And it's, it's up to everybody involved to recognize. And the churches that are represented here, by the way, there, is, there are no small churches. Right. Because when you got the Spirit of God in you, it's a big, big movement that you're a part of. And uh, I had a, a friend correct me with that years ago when I pastored up in the mountains. I said, it's, we're so thankful to have this, this dear prophet friend come to such a small place. And he corrected me after. He said, don't ever do that again. And uh, so every, every ministry that's represented here is very significant in the eyes of God. And what's about to happen uh, in Springfield, I don't think is, I think James River, uh, the church here is going to be at, the, you know, an epicenter. But I, but I, I think there's going to be many, many other places that are involved. I don't, I don't think it's just one church. I think it's a regional thing. And, um, yeah. So you just prepare your heart for him, you know. It's a pretty generic answer, but it's really, really true. Uh, don't think you know how he's going to show up because he is full of surprises. And, uh, and you know, the guys on the road to Emmaus, remember, Jesus walked with them and they didn't recognize him. Sometimes he shows up differently. And it's up to us to recognize him when he comes. He'll change his appearance just to make sure that we're anchored into presence and not into manifestations. Yeah, wow. That's good. Yeah. Would you mind praying for us um, as we close? Let's all stand. And uh, would you just pray over us, Bill? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. really is a regional I can I can feel it and see it uh, being in this room that what's about to happen uh, the word that I gave last night was specifically for James River but as I'm sitting here this morning I'm realizing as I'm talking that it's a lot bigger and much more significant than I thought and that there's a lot of places represented in this room that are going to have equal equal outpourings and and uh assigned to carry certain aspects of this move of God. So Father, first we just acknowledge you as the life giver. You're always good. You're perfect in every way. Your affection for us is so amazing and so deep. I ask for every single life, every person in this room, every ministry that's represented, that you would mark them with the glory, mark them with the presence of God. Above everything else, even let the middle of the night moments be filled with the presence of God in their homes, in their beds, in their cars, every place that they would be, there would be this unusual awareness of the Spirit of God. We give you first place. We acknowledge you as absolute Lord. We also acknowledge our absolute dependency on you. We come to you as children dependent on a good Father. And I do pray that your glory come and mark this part of our nation. Let a wellspring of life flow forth from this city, from these ministries, to feed a nation, I pray in Jesus' name. And give us the wisdom to sustain it. Amen. Thank you so much for joining James River Church on our YouTube channel. Our prayer is that you were encouraged and your faith was strengthened today. And we want to let you know that we'd love for you to be a part of our online family. As well, we'd love if you subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell for notifications. You'll be so glad you did because we're always putting out great sermons, new worship content, and it helps you know when we go live for our weekly services. We hope you have an amazing day and thank you again for watching. God bless.